Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. As always, I hope you had a great week. Where you can find Let's Talk Micro? Well, Let's Talk Micro is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Pandora, GoodPods, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio. Wherever you listen to your podcast, you can find Let's Talk Micro. As far as social media, I am on Instagram as Let's Talk Micro, no apostrophe, and on Twitter as Let's Talk Micro 1. So go ahead and follow. You know, leave any feedback, possible to- uh, podcast topics. The feedback is always welcome and appreciated. I always like to post pictures of organisms and I like to give updates as to when the next episode is coming out. You can also find me on LinkedIn as Luis Plaza. So go ahead and check it out. Follow, comments, suggestions, feedback. Like I said, everything is welcome and appreciated. And if you haven't checked out the previous episode, go ahead and do so. I went ahead and I talked about Streptococcus pneumoniae or strep pneumo. You know, I talked about morphology. I talked about identification, pathogenesis. So Streptococcus pneumoniae or Strep pneumo is a gram-positive cocci in pairs, which is a tip, you know, it's very typical morphology. So go ahead and remember that. And I will talk about that in a little bit. It is catalyst negative. It is susceptible to optogen with a zone of 40 millimeters or greater. And if you want a refresher on optogen, go ahead and check out episode 8 of this podcast. So the strains, if they are encapsulated, you know, they are virulent. And then if they are not encapsulated, they are avirulent. And encapsulated strains, I talk about morphology. Those that are encapsulated, they are mucoid. So when you're working with a control strain, you might not, you know, those are non-mucoid. So and those are unencapsulated. So keep that in mind. As far as, you know, virulence, it has a polysaccharide capsule, which is called C capsule, you know, which is associated with the virulence. And then also has pneumolysin, which is a cholesterol dependent satellite. It has phosphorylcholine, which binds receptors for certain cells. And this helps in the spreading of the organism. And I mentioned that this is a very serious organism, one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality. You know, it is seen in pneumonia, meningitis, and otitis media. And I get some, you know, I gave some percentages. So as far as otitis media, you know, it is the, in, in children up to three years old, it is actually the most common infection seen with strep pneumo. And with pneumonia, it is actually causes 95% of all bacterial pneumonias. So this is a very serious organism. And some people actually carry it without causing any harm. You know, they carry it in the respiratory tract. And I also mentioned that there is a test that can be used to differentiate strep pneumo from other alpha strep, which is called the bile solubility test. And it is basically depending on amidase, which is an enzyme. And basically what this bile salt is going to do, it's going to lyse streptococcus pneumoniae or strep pneumo. And I talked about you can perform this test via two methods. You have the spot test where you add a deoxycholate solution, deoxycholate, sorry, solution directly to a colony. You incubate and then the colonies, you know, there's clearing where they lies. Or you can make a, the tube method, which is a 0.5 McFarlane. And then you add the, the deoxycholate solution, you incubate and you should see clearing. And when you make this solution, you split it equally into two tubes, and one of them you use as a control, so you don't add anything. So it should remain turbid. So a positive test should be clearing, and a negative test, it's turbid. There was no change. So go ahead and, if you haven't checked it out, like I said, go ahead and do so. Great information about Streptococcus pneumoniae. And I mentioned that it grows in you know, your typical media, such as blood, chocolate, PEA. So go ahead and check it out. So now that I have covered morphology, you know, 
biochemicals for strep pneumo, let's talk about other ways of identifying it. Let's talk about other tests. Well, those of you that work in a lab, you know that, you know, you might have seen it. There is a popular antigen test called the Binex Streptococcus pneumoniae antigen card. And this is made by Abbott. This is a rapid immunochromatographic assay for the detection of streptococcus pneumoniae on patients with pneumococcal pneumonia and meningitis. The test detects pneumococcal soluble antigen in human urine and CSF, and this is from the package insert of the test. The card has control antibody and rabbit anti strep pneumo antibody. And what kind of samples are used? Well, for pneumonia, you need urine and CSF for meningitis. I have never seen it perform in, in CSF in the lab. I mean, it's always for urine. So the test comes with the test, you know, test cards. It has a reagent A, which contains citrate and phosphate buffer. It comes with specimen swabs and controls, which are a positive and a negative swab. And these are color coded. So you have a red swab, which is your positive control, and you have a blue swab, which is your negative control. So the positive swab has inactivated strep pneumo antigen, and the negative swab does not. So let's go ahead and start with specimen requirements. So you need urine that has been stored at room temperature for 24 hours or refrigerated or frozen up to 14 days is acceptable. Boric acid preserved urine is also acceptable. So those of you that work in the lab, you see the little gray tops where you put urine that contains boric acid and that's acceptable. So if you get, you know, it's, so if you're missing a test, you can use one that came for a new analysis. So CSF store at room temperature for 24 hours or also refrigerate is acceptable or samples that have been frozen for up to one week. And when I mention urines, yeah, if they have been frozen up to 14 days, that's acceptable. So how is the test performed? Well, you bring the samples to room temperature. Then your test card has two holes. You did the swab in the specimen and they place it in the bottom hole and you push it upwards. Then you add three drops of reagent A to the bottom hole. The inside of the card has an adhesive liner. You peel that off and you close the card. Once you close it, you can leave it at room temperature and read after 15 minutes. And if you are testing controls, you add six drops instead of three to the bottom of the hole. So what does a negative and a positive look like? So a negative result is a single pink to purple color line in the top half of the window. This line means that the test was performed correctly. And then a positive result is two lines. You have your control line and a pink sample line. The intensity of the line depends on the amount of antigen present in the sample. Any line for the test is a positive line. And I like to stress that out, you know, any line, any intensity of a line, it's a positive result. That's something that I always like to mention. And those of you that work in the lab can relate to this, which is, right, sometimes, you know, you, you perform your test and you see the line, maybe very faint, you put it against the light and you're looking at it, you ask a coworker, do you see a line here? Do you don't see it? Are you a little afraid to report it? Maybe repeat it, barely see the line. Do I call it a positive or a negative? So this test, you know, and this is not only with, with strep pneumo, other, you know, chromatographic tests and that you have, you know, a test line and a control line. So typically any intensity, any intensity of a line, so any line, regardless of intensity, is a positive result. So this is something to keep in mind. Whether it is a very strong line or very faint, it is considered a positive result. And just like other tests where you have a control line, so if you have a test where you don't have any lines or your control line is control line is missing, this is considered an invalid result. 
And at that point in time, you need to repeat the test. So always make sure, you know, like I mentioned, this is a test that you, you add the, you know, the drops to the swab and then you close the card and then you wait 15 minutes. So this test definitely has walk away capabilities. You can go ahead and set them up, set a timer and go ahead and continue doing other tests. But what you have to make sure is that when you close the card, you know, you make sure that the card it's closed properly. Because a lot of times, you know, if you don't do that, maybe you were light when you closed it or it can just pop open. So just make sure that it's properly closed before you walk away. And something else before you walk away, make sure that the actual, you know, that the, the sample is migrating. Because, you know, you, you put your swab, you add your drops, you close your car and make sure that the sample starts migrating up. Because sometimes it happens, you know, like you go ahead and you do your testing, you close the card, set your timer, walk away. And then when you come back in 15 minutes, you realize that it hasn't migrated. So then you go ahead, you have to go ahead and repeat the test. So in the lab, sometimes, you know, it's all about time, making sure you, we perform our tests correctly. So you need to make sure those two things before you walk away. So you don't waste time, which are make sure it has migrated and that the card is properly closed. As far as limitations of the test, it was validated on urine and CSF samples. So other samples were not validated. You know, it has a 90% specificity. And having said that, Bailey and Scott's microbiology in our great textbook that I use constantly, says that urine antigen testing has been proven effective for adult patients that receive antimicrobial treatment prior to a primary culture. So meaning that before a culture was performed, they had antibiotic treatment and that's when the test you know, performs the best. So it does not differentiate between present and past infections. And according to the American Society of Microbiology, for the, their manual of clinical microbiology, this test is positive in patients that are carriers without infection. So remember that I said before that you can carry this organism without it causing any problems and you can have a positive test. And this is actually often observed among children. So it should not be used in children below six. And it is recommended in adults that when you perform this test, you perform it along with a traditional culture. So just not by itself. You should be doing some sort of culture like a sputum culture or something like that when you are performing this test. So definitely keep that in mind when this test has been performed, you know, has good specificity, but it cannot differentiate between a, you know, a past and a current infection. And carriers might have a positive test for this. But it's, you know, it's a very popular test. You definitely see it a lot in the micro lab. And those of you that remember, you know, we definitely saw an increase with COVID. You know, they were ordering sputum cultures, uh, Legionella, strep pneumo, and sometimes, you know, there were shortages and they were back order. So definitely, you know, we struggled with this during COVID as far as having proper supply, you know, numbers. And like I mentioned before, you know, since streptococcus pneumoniae can cause, you know, causes meningitis, it is part of your meningitis panel. So when you, those of you that work in the lab and, uh, you know, you run a meningitis test, for example, you know, like a very popular one is from uh, BioMoreau, they have the BioFire system, and there's the ME panel, the meningitis panel. So strep pneumo is one of the targets. For you, the audience, what other organisms would you expect to see in a test like this? I'll give you a few seconds to think. Well, you definitely see E. coli. You see Streptococcus agalactiae. You see Cryptococcus neoformans. So, you know, these organisms, they cause meningitis, so they are part of this meningitis panels. So this is from the BioFire, the ME panel. So you also have for, as far as blood cultures, you have, you know, as part of the the PCR, molecular nucleic acid testing, Streptococcus pneumoniae is one of the targets. For example, you know, Luminex 
has a very gene system for blood cultures that has a gram positive panel for blood culture samples. So one of the targets is Streptococcus pneumoniae. And this is where that gram stain morphology comes in handy. Remember, I've been saying so far, it is a gram positive coxine pairs, is a very distinctive morphology, and you as a tech, you as a student, I've been asking you to keep it in mind, to remember it. And this is why. With, with this particular panel, one of the limitations of the system is that Streptococcus mitis can have cross-reactivity with the strep pneumo probes. So what does this mean? It means that maybe the sample has Streptococcus mitis, which is another alpha hemolytic strep. The test can yield a false positive result for strep pneumo, and I have seen it. So typically when you are working blood cultures, right, your instrument flags the bottle as positive, you go ahead and do your gram stain, and you go ahead and report that. And then if you have one of the setups that we can, where you can run a molecular test, you go ahead and run your test. You know, it typically takes about two hours. And then you go ahead and, up, and update your result. So, for example, you have gram-positive coxine chains. You call it to the floor. And then your result comes back as strep pneumo from that molecular test. And then you go ahead and update it to strep pneumo. And then guess what? It might not grow on the plate. You might get strep mitis. When I talk about remembering that morphology, if you are running this particular test and you get a strep pneumo result, correlate that with the gram stain. Maybe if you saw regular gram positive coxine chains, I would recommend to holding off on the result, document it internally, and then verify the ID once the organism grows on the plate. But if you get the strep pneumo ID, and then you go to your gram stain and you remember that it was gram positive coxine pairs, then it will be okay to release that result. So just be careful. Granted, like I mentioned before, organisms, they do not go to school. They don't read books, so they do whatever they want. There are many factors, you know, like antibiotics and other things that can affect the morphology of a cell. So you can sometimes have a typical presentation. So you could have a a strep pneumo that just doesn't look, you know, it's not the gram positive coxine pairs. But, you know, it happens. You can have unusual presentations. But what I'm asking is, you know, just if the gram stain doesn't correlate with that ID, hold off on reporting it. Just document it internally and then verify the organism once it grows on the plate. And like I said, you know, you can't have atypical morphologies. I once had a listeria that this very gene system called listeria and the gram stain looked nothing like listeria it wasn't you know it wasn't the short gram positive rods so we you know held on reporting that id it was documented internally but guess what when it grew on the plate it was a listeria so you do have a typical presentation but you know you always proceed with caution that way you don't make an error and erroneously report something. As far as other systems, you know, BioFire, again, it also has a blood culture panel called the BCID2 that it also identifies Streptococcus pneumonia. But it does not seem to have that, that cross-reactivity issue. So there are quite a few tests out there that can identify strep pneumo. There are some things that you should keep in mind. You know, now with Malditov, you might be seeing more of another member of the S. mitis group, which is called Streptococcus pseudopneumoniae. Because, you know, if you look at, you know, once you're looking at your textbook, strep pneumo, it's part of the strep mitis group. So this organism, Streptococcus pseudopneumoniae, it was separated from strep pneumo. It causes respiratory tract infections in patients with predisposing conditions such as COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, disease. So it is not encapsulated. It is insoluble in bile. So remember the bile solubility test. So it is insoluble, so it would not lyse. So if you have a suspension, it should remain turbid. 
And this organism, it is susceptible to optokin only when it is incubated in non-CO2. And as far as optokin, you can also have some strains of Streptococcus oralis and Streptococcus mitis that can be susceptible to optokin. However, they are insoluble in bile. So once again, insoluble in bile means that, you know, there will be no ghost, ghost colonies or clearing of the deoxycholate solution. So if you're doing the colonies, there will be no clearing because there's no lysis. And if you're doing the, the tube, the suspension will remain turbid. So keep that in mind when you're working on the bench, when you're reading optical disc, when you're performing IDs. So if you get this organism, Streptococcus pseudonymoniae, it is insoluble in bile, so it has a negative viral solubility test, and it is not encapsulated. And only when it's incubated in non-CO2, it can be susceptible to optokin. So keep that in mind. And that, my dear audience, it's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed learning about strep pneumo, testing, and also about strep pseudonymonia. As always, I enjoy sharing this information with you. As always, continue bringing that passion to what you do. It's so important. You know, we do such great work and the patients need our best. Because remember, that's what we do it for. So the patients get the best information, the best results, so they can get the best treatment. It is about them. It as always, I mean, you know, I, I always like to mention that I like suggestions. So if you're a student out there and you have a possible topic that you want to learn about, or if you would like me to speak, do a presentation for your program, go ahead and you know have your director contact me as, at lestalkmicro at outlook.com. So as always, stay motivated, stay safe, and of course, continue talking micro. Until the next time, bye.